This morning I started generating data. The moment I opened my eyes, I checked the weather on my phone to make sure I was dressed appropriately. I checked Facebook and the BBC News website to see what's going on. This generates data into my personal life. It speaks to how I create value. It's not really big data, it's little data. It's all about me. So today's talk, Seeing the Use of Things, How Internet of Things Will Shape Future Business. Uh, I'm Professor Glenn Parry. I'm from the Centre of Digital Economy. Uh, I'm Head of Department of Digital Economy, Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Surrey. Now, the title is a bit dull because, you know, really what we're looking at is avoiding the crisis of the mundane, you know, those boring things that go wrong in your life such as getting rained on you want to avoid that we can do better than that how about how data can make life more awesome because you know that's much more fun to talk about so the session's drawing upon this open access paper and um, that i did with sarah brax roger moore and uh, professor ryan ung uh, visibility of consumer context improving reverse supply chain with the internet of things that's published in supply chain management the aim the focus, understanding the nature of value creation and business models within the home. And we're looking at how the IoT develops and we're looking at personal data and those associated business models. So hopefully you can think about how data shapes business models and how you might collect that data. So background. Businesses are responsible for their products through life. Firms have got to consider supply, reuse, recovery, repair, recondition and disposal. But often firms don't have any data on the use of their product. So you buy something, but you don't really share how you used it. So we don't know if you've never used it, that product is practically brand new or if you hammered it, used it every day. And we focus upon consumer use processes as value creation. So when you use something, that's when you create value. And also that's the beginning of the reverse supply chain. You know, it's step towards hitting that garbage bin or being recycled, reconditioned. Uh, and our argument here is if we can put sensors on things, internet of things type sensors, we can get use data that can be then informative for the rest of the supply chain. We've got a, a problem, we've got what we call information asymmetry in the home. You know as a consumer your activities, what you do, how you use resources in combination. But the suppliers don't have any real visibility into the home, how consumers use things they buy. And it's the context of use, how you use things together with what, you know, in, in what environment that informs the value creating processes and what we see is unexpected use and combinations arising you know when you go around your friend's house you see them maybe cooking and you think well i i, I don't do it that way my process is different and, and that's the sort of thing we're really interested in because use is the starting point of this reverse supply chain we can see how stuff ends up you know in recycling or or, or in, in landfill Now your data is in verticals and it's taken by a number of firms you use. So I'm not, I'm not sure what data you think firms hold on you, but if you consider shopping, power, gas, petrol, all this is data being kept. You know, every time you go shopping, they're, they're getting loads of data on you and your phone is constantly telling people where you are. So a lot of data is being held by many different firms. But this is missing the horizontal. These are data verticals. The links between these are really interesting. What you did, when, where and with who, that provides real insight. With consumption data, we can improve business models, creating more sustainable supply chains. Now, each person in the UK is using 140 litres of water per day. It's producing 400 kilograms of domestic waste a year. In 2015, only uh, you know, a quarter of, of the plastic 
wrapping used was was recycled and you know if you go to the supermarket and you try and do a shop without buying any plastic wrapping it's, oh, it's just impossible we don't really know what people do with their, most of their products or, or when they're going to be finished with them it's it's very reactive to oh there's you know there's a pile of rubbish outside and there's an opportunity to develop much smarter business models to support longer life products to support products the way we use them you know electrical goods alone there's 800 million pounds per annum of, of stuff being dumped uh, use allows for more reuse repair recondition recycling you know if, if we knew more more about the life history of that product um, we could probably recycle it or repurpose it uh, much more easily uh, and for those eagle-eyed amongst you this little diagram uh, they're spinning the world the wrong way that just bugs me every time I see it So our research question, how Internet of Things can be operationalised in the home to capture data on consumer value and the implications for supply. So some theoretical frameworks. What does value mean to you? Now, notionally, all these things are valuable, you know, holidays, jewellery, friendship. Value can conceptually be taken to mean some measure of good. The reality is that value is poorly understood in practice and academia. And the word value is just abused and used when they mean many different things by it. Plato proposed that value existed in two forms, the intrinsic value, things that are good to have them themselves, and the extrinsic value, which is something that you have and it helps you achieve something else that's good. Um, but those two things are not viewed by Plato as to be mutually exclusive, because some things could actually both have both of those properties. So think about what you hold to be intrinsically good. What do you think is just good? What do you think is end extrinsically good? What do you, do you like to have that, you know, it can help you achieve good? And is goodness a property of a thing? Can we measure it? Is it there all the time? Think about your ontological position. Most philosophers hold to the concept of intrinsic goodness, that some things are intrinsically good, that it's, you know, a property, the experience of of them is good. Uh, now, William Frank Kenner provides this list from literature of things deemed to be good or rational to be desirable for their own sake. So here's his list, you know, happiness, truth, freedom, beauty, harmony, uh, things that are morally good, virtues, friendship. It's quite a nice list. Ungan Smith identifies six types of business value across the, the academic literature. They find utility, which is the satisfaction derived by a customer during consumption, evaluated at the point of exchange when you buy it. Economic worth, often you know, net present or lifetime value, created from a customer's willingness to pay. Perceived satisfaction, this is uh, a customer expectations being exceeded and it's that idea that you can change the property of the good and, and the consumer is somehow passive and you deliver to them value and it exceeds their expectations. Net benefit is the consumer trade-off and uh, deciding you know I'll take this not that and again evaluated at the point of exchange means ends is the perceived attribute of an offer to meet you know the consumer requirement um the value of the attributes of an offer are consumed in use so value is created uh when the performance fits to outcomes so it's post consumption this one's a little different from the others you can see <clears throat> phenomenal experience is where where value is perceived not in the object but fully in the use and experience of it. And again, that's quite different to those above. 
Plato, Aristotle and this chap present value as utility existing in the exchange of unitary outputs. So this is Adam Smith, Wealth of the Nations, who characterised uh, wealth creation for a country through the export of goods. Uh, obviously in his day, stuff was put on ships. Value was realised when you exchanged that for other goods. Uh, so value is perceived as being in exchanges uh, and value happens in markets. So it's often thought that value is created in markets. Now, this sort of thinking really does continue to underpin contemporary business thought. We've had, and you'll see in your textbooks, uh, manufacturing focus tends to be that you know goods are inherently valuable the perception are, 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 are is shared that value is an intrinsic intrinsic property of things lepac uh, brought in some interesting work on dimensions of value creation looking at value creation at the societal level um, at the organizational level and at the individual level and very much uh, focus of his work was this idea of value slippage where value created by one source or at one level of analysis may be captured or may create greater benefit to an, a different level uh, and you know this creates inequalities between the levels or it may be appropriate you know that maybe through taxation society brings tax in and, and that's shared differently so this idea of value slippage very interesting Now there's some problems with contemporary thinking. Firms judge good from market demand. Individuals' decisions are influenced by use, but actually more heavily by choice. If you think about buying things, often you're not buying what you choose, but you're you're not buying what you'd like, but actually you're buying what you can choose from between, and, and you're often choosing availability of substitutes. So you go to a shop and you'd really like this, but actually you're offered two different things, so you choose between them. And that's deemed to be the good thing, when actually you probably would have bought something else if it was available. Focus on market choice, decisions and substitutes ignores use. So a lot of the marketing materials and production is based on demand, but not on use. What are people using it for? Uh, what are those individuals really wanting? What are the contexts of their use? Utility becomes a proxy for use. What could it do, not what does it do? Because that's outside of context. And use is therefore determined at exchange and doesn't change. So the idea here is you buy something and that's its use. But if you think about the way you use things, that changes depending on what your context and your circumstance. Use in context is very much marginalised by a lot of the studies, whilst markets and choice are being dominating. They're you know, deciding what you buy, deciding how things are designed, not the way you use them. I mean, we've only really got to look at chairs. Um, how many people, maybe even now, have a coat over the back of their chair? Everybody does that, and yet chairs are never designed for it. Firms are usually behaving like somebody standing on a motorway bridge. They're observing the process. They're seeing maybe individuals going in certain directions. They're noting repeat journeys. What they're not asking ever is why. What's the goal? What's the context? Is that journey necessary? Maybe we could take a lot of people off the road if we started to look at that. When do you create value for the firm? Is it only at the point of exchange when you sell something? If you accept use creates value, how can we do different things with that? How can we understand value and context? Businesses really need to understand the multitude of meanings of value because obviously value is financial worth, but there are other ways of thinking about it. Maybe we can shift value perception from this focus on exchange towards use. Defining client value is challenging. Typically, we look at the exchange because that's when you know you have the interaction with the client, maybe in a shop, you see what they buy. Value is thought of intrinsic to the good. So somebody buys an umbrella, they go, oh, that's, that's a great umbrella. It's going to keep me dry. Um, 
maybe we can innovate and say, how does somebody use something and how good is it when they, when it is used? Because I don't know about you, but I get through a lot of umbrellas because they're pretty rubbish when it's windy. Phenomenological experience value is, is not part of the object. That is in the use experience of the customer. What do they observe? What do they feel when they use something? So let's consider which is more valuable, gold or polystyrene. For this individual here, let's consider their context. They're not really in the market for gold because that's going to sink them. They're in the market for polystyrene. The value to, of your offer to a client is only known when you understand how they're going to integrate that into their lives. Let's think about staplers and how you might maximize. Traditionally, the exchange business models that we might come up with is buying staplers cheaply, selling them you know, for, for money to make that margin. So you might make it in a low cost country, ship it around somewhere where they'll pay more for it, have multiple colors, staples, refills, make money on the secondary market. If we consider use, we're considering well, what's somebody using this for? They're holding paper together. So what sort of business am I actually in? Am I in binding services? One of my students bought me a brilliant stapler that doesn't have any staples in it. You use it and it sort of folds the paper together in some weird way and there's no staples. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, and this thought isn't new. This is uh, Karl Marx who you know, he's been through this a lot of his work. He was uh, an economist and you can see these ideas reflected in his work. Use value is difficult to capture as it's individual, perceptual and contextual and contexts keep changing. Individual perceptions change with context and new information. So we've got to have a constant stream of new use information. What are people like? What are they doing with it? How's that changed? We need to understand changing patterns of use. All these things here were considered to be good in their time. I don't know if you recognize them all, but now they're all pretty much out of date. In supply chain management, we discuss closed loop supply chain. And here's the, the sort of image, you know, we start from raw materials, go through manufacturing, distribution, maybe retail, wholesale, and then to consumers. And then afterwards we have landfill, maybe there's maybe a returns process that might be splitting it into spares or, or some form of remanufacture. And the idea is that this is you know, a closed loop, but we have a decoupling point and the consumers often treated as though they're, they're a shelf and they're black boxed. So really the loop's not closed because we don't know what happens there. Business models show firms value creation and capture processes. A firm produces a value proposition. Now here we must understand that a value proposition isn't inherently valuable, it's just an idea. The value is realized in use and context by the consumer. From this relationship, the firm must capture some form of sustainable worth. Any firm can give away free lollipops, but at some point someone's got to pay for those. Currently, point of sale data is available and that's what firms measure. That influences the value proposition design. How many of those things did we sell? It ignores what's being done, how value is being realized in use. Often firms use survey data to capture this. However, we can do better with sensor data because surveys can be unreliable. Internet of Things use data actually tells you who's using what and when and how they're using it because we can use multiple data sets. Use capture is done in complex engineering services. This is the example of a helicopter. It's provided, it's sold with a, a thousand flying hours and it's got health usage monitoring systems on it. So it knows the temperature, the use, the flying time, all that sort of information. Any failures are all logged and then we can 
uh, monitor and maintain that asset. Whilst we've moved towards the Internet of Things, we can get much cheaper, low quality sensors and we can put those in the home. So let's look at use value, visibility and Internet of Things. So value is only being realized by the client during their experience of an offer, their use within a specific place, time and setting. That's the context. If we can get information about that, we can understand much more about our product. Value creation is understood through the relationship lens. The customer provides links, which we describe as service encounters or episodes. And that's really what we're interested in. Encounters and episodes are opportunities to collect information on value creation. So using IoT, we propose to get this dynamic visibility data of consumers during their use processes. So let's look at our experimental methods and results. The hub of all things is a platform we call a microserver or a repository we use to collect data. It's a bit like an email account apart from it holds your data. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dropbox or those sort of um, web based um, data repositories. It's a little smarter than that because you can also do work inside a, a, a PDA or PDMA. You can run algorithms inside your your data repository and, and send results from analysis of that data. So we had six people collect, collecting data. It's now a hub of all things. has now got a spin-off firm called DataSwift, which you can look at many thousands of users. But this is where we started. And these, these personal data microservers mean individuals own their own data. And this really helps firms really quite like this because it helps with GDPR compliance. The individuals holding their data work can be done in the individual's data store, just the results come back. So there's no transfer of, of personal data. We undertook an explorative case study of six users capturing quantitative data from sensors and systems in homes. We instrumented rooms. We put lots of sensors around to create what we call data density. We did interviews, we did home visits so we could really understand what those sensors were picking up. We focused upon sharing activity because that's a difficult space. It's private. We couldn't put videos in there. It's wet, so we couldn't use high quality sensors that require mains power. Um, so we really had to be careful because, you know, a lot of the sensors get destroyed when they get wet. We start off identifying, identifying the many resources in the shower room. And there's a crazy amount of stuff people keep in that small space. All the resources were examined for how they're used. And what we said was, well, these things are depleted, you know, things like toothpaste, you're using them up. Then water and electricity, they're being used, but they're not being depleted because, you know, it come, it's piped in or, or, or comes in the wire. So they're consumed, but not depleted. Then you've got things like hand towels. Uh, they are used and experienced and they're sort of diminished a little bit because you have to wash them eventually. Um, but they're not really consumed or depleted. Then you have what we call interaction. And that's things like, you know, opening the door to get in. You interact with it, but it, it's not really diminished like a towel and it's definitely not consumed or depleted. So those are our four different modes of use. And then we looked at how do we measure those things? Interaction data, experience data, depletion data and consumption data. What are the mechanisms we can use to measure them in different ways? So interaction, we could measure you know, when somebody touches it. We have some form of sensor that measures that experience data again, some form of interaction measurement depletion. We can use uh, weight consumption. We need some form of flow meters on that one. So here's some interaction data for the shower room. Interestingly, we had a, what's called a Z-Wave humidity sensor in here. And there you can see the humidity, how, how it changes against time. What you can see there is each peak represents a shower activity and it gives a count of how many times that shower is used, the time of shower, and actually we can work out the duration. 
Here we had a flood sensor that we put in the base of the shower. Again, this tells us how long the shower is flowing for. And we saw, you know, people often said, oh, I'm only five minutes in the shower. We saw this average of 21 minutes. So it gives a, a count of the interaction in the shower. We know the volume of water a shower sprays, so we can work out the volume of water used in a shower. That was interesting because the volume of water and the duration of the shower was much longer than the individuals thought. So let's look at an example of experience data. This is a towel. We put a motion sensor in the towel and here you can see use over time. It appeared that the towel was more used more often than the owner expected because others were using their towel to dry their hands. This was interesting because it shows that use is maybe not what you expect it to be. Here we see some depletion data of some shampoo, uh, nice and linear. That's interesting because you know with this sort of model you can see that a standard you know what's that 60 day two bi-monthly uh, mail out of a shampoo would actually meet this user requirement they would have constant shampoo so that sort of subscription model would actually work for them here we can see another depletion example this is for shower gel you can see it's far less linear it's all over the shop this one so we looked at what was going on. Uh, the monthly delivery model here would fail. So from the interviews, we, we found out that first a dog knocked over the, the bottle of shower gel. And these little steps were a result of the owners going running and using more shower gel after a run. So we could prove that because we also had Fitbit data, we correlate the two. And every time they went running, we saw this shower gel consumption increasing by 100%. So combining data sets reveals correlations. So we get more insight into consumption patterns. So findings of the case shows this IoT implementation and operationalization in the home. We're tracking consumption, use and resource in combination. There's lots of implications for this study. Consumer perception of use is different to actual. So the time in showers longer, the towels were used much more often than thought. Survey data would be misleading there. We found activities moderating others, longer runs leading to longer showers and much a greater use of shower gel. So we also got uh, we also got insight into resource combinations and practices. One of the things that was noticeable were, was people weren't using the, if you like, and um, providers uh, defined shampoo and shower gel or soap combinations. And um, we could see how individuals value co-creation practices differ. And most people assumed what they did was perfectly normal, but they were quite different. Um, some resource combinations we could assume correlate you know as you use water you consume uh, shower gel and shampoo others we didn't uh, see necessarily correlations would exist and that's the running and the, the showering process you know nike maybe could could expand them into the market of shampoo a useful categorization of data types to use when examining processes i hope which is this this uh, set we have interaction experience depletion and consumption different ways of considering how we use or experience resources so benefits for iot for supply chain we can design our touch points for product acquisition we can improve the timings and plannings for you know the reverse re supply chain we can utilize customer data for effectiveness, train people to use our product correctly, or if they won't or they're abusing it, maybe we could sack customers. Uh, we can improve the process by understanding patterns of use. So data enables with consumer of consent, of, of consent, of course, a truly closed loop supply chain. We can get rid of that box. We can feed that data both backwards and forwards within our supply chain and, and really help efficiency, effectiveness, design, all, all these touch points. So in summary, we've got these value creating activities and outcomes mutually constituted within social and cultural contexts. 
We've shown how IoT implementation and operization really helps us uh, design and develop value combinations. We see that the consumer's perceptions are unreliable. We see activities being moderators for others. And we can see how IoT can help you develop insight. Let's think about measuring value in use. If you can think of an activity or a business, it could be something social. But what sensors could you use to measure it? What do you want to understand? Can you know how good it is? What does good mean? And how might you measure that? What the category of measures, uh, what do they fit into? And what does that tell you about value in use? And therefore, would you change the business model? How can you innovate? How can you build those sensors in and grow your business? So really we're about avoiding the crisis of the mundane. Why not have an internet enabled toilet roll uh, measurer? So you know if you've got any left or shower gel measurer. We've, we've already done these things. We've got connected devices for the home. We can automate replenishment, making depletion appear like consumption. Retailers could innovate their apps. So knowing what you need, they could then pitch to you saying, well, you're out and about. Why not come to us? We can create new markets so individuals can cr trade their data, maybe with these providers to get the best prices. So let's consider what you might have measured, why you might have measured it. Go back and forth between the principles and what you do. Those theories about is it intrinsic or extrinsic value that you're really thinking about. So hopefully that's some interesting ideas from today. Um, lots to think about there. Uh, and do consider you know, looking at my other projects, my papers. Uh, you can contact me through various means. I, I just hope you find this interesting.